We believe here at The Story that every single person has a story that is amazing and valuable, and we believe that our individual stories get weaved into the story of God through the story of Jesus. That's the gospel. Our stories intersect with God's story in his story um, through the gospel. And so each week we have a testimony of how the gospel is going out uh, and, and reaching individuals' lives. And for the next four weeks, we're gonna be doing stories revolving around foster care or resource parenting. Um, that is obviously so near and dear to the heart of God, our Father, who's a father to the orphan, to the widow, to the fatherless. And, uh, and so for the next four weeks, we're gonna be talking about that and how we as a church can practically minister with God's spirit uh, to the little children. Like Jesus said, let the little children come to me. So next four weeks, our foster care stories. And the first of those stories is going to be from one of our very own elders, uh, Brian Pinnell. So would you please welcome him up? Thank you so much, bro. Good morning. So I am sharing uh, my story, but not in the way that we normally hear individuals share their story uh, this morning. I'm just sharing a small chapter of, of a story that so far has 48 chapters, I guess you could say. And, and uh, this was a chapter that took place, that, but it was, and it was a short chapter um, in a lot of ways, but it was perhaps the most shaping and formative of my life. Um, and so uh, about seven years ago, I stepped into the most powerful ministry work that I have ever done. And the irony is I stepped out of working full-time at a church that I had been working at for 17 years as a pastor. I stepped out of that, and I went to a job and a role working for the state of Oregon. And I was working for the Department of Human Services in Child Protective Services. Right? And it was the weirdest thing. It was, a, it was time to move on from that ministry. It wasn't a, a, a negative thing. It wasn't, there wasn't any hurt involved uh, or any, anything bad taking place. It was just God calling me somewhere else. And strangely enough, this is where he called me. And I remember a lot of people saying, man, I can't believe that you left ministry. Like, I just think of you as a pastor. I can't believe you left ministry. And I remember thinking, I've actually stepped into the most full ministry I've ever been a part of. If only, if only you, you could see ministry in a different way. As a matter of fact, one of my highlights for those 17 years of being a youth and family pastor in Medford, every year we did a summer camp called Southern Oregon Christian Camp. Um, and several of you in this crowd, one, two, seven of you at least were part of that camp. And some of you were baptized at that camp, right? And, and, and it was just a highlight of my year. And so the, the year after I stepped out of running that camp, I was asked to go back and speak. And I remember it was at Kellogg Springs Church, uh, outside of Sutherland, and I remember going, and the guy that ran the camp was talking to me. He's like, man, I got to be honest. I'm just, I was so sad when I heard that you stepped out of ministry. And I said, Bill, I, I haven't though. Like, I haven't stepped out of ministry. And he, and he said, well, you know, you're not preaching about Jesus every day. And I was like, but do you know what I'm doing? <laughs> you know, do you know what I'm doing? And I tried to explain it to him. And he said, I just guess I don't consider it ministry if you're not getting to, at the end of whatever you're doing, preach the name of Jesus. I said, well, maybe you think of it this way, Bill. Instead of preaching the name of Jesus, I have the blessing of walking behind Jesus and watching his restorative work take place in our county. You know? and, and that's what I got to do for about five years. And it was some of the most beautiful and some of the most difficult work that I've ever done. Um, we have people here that are doing that work now. And I can say from the bottom of my heart that I believe these are modern day superheroes, the people that step into this work every day and do this sort of thing. But during that time, um, I worked in a job called intake. And in intake, um, that you're the person that get, when the, when the call comes into the hotline about possible abuse, and if it gets assigned, you're the person that goes out to the home or to the school or to whoever and talks to the children and talks to the family um, and, and, and basically investigates these allegations of child abuse. And as you can imagine, it's a heavy job. It's, 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 it's a hard job, um, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a divine job, you know, because your, your job is to find, make sure first and foremost that those children are safe. If they're not, it is to find a safe situation to place them in while you work to find tools and services and everything you need to try to rehab that family for unification again um, and to hopefully um, bring them back together as a family unit. But in that time, I thought I was prepared. I had seen a lot in my years as a pastor. I had had hard meetings. I had had difficult counseling sessions. Um, but my, you can't really be prepared 
for the, the things that are true that you don't want to be true. I knew that bad things existed around us and, and not every home was a good home. Um, but you don't like to, to think and then discover that it's, it's in your backyard. And it's more in your backyard than you think it is. And I remember my very first day. My very first day, so I don't, I'm not even taking cases yet, but there was a really contentious case, and they had the police in one of the, uh, our other offices, kind of, there was a mediation, a family meeting going on. They are trying to figure out how to get this family situation involved. They asked me, the brand new guy, can you come over and just watch these four kids? There's four little kids involved. We need an adult to sit with them while this takes place. And Okay, no problem. I love playing with kids, right? So I go and I'm playing with the kids and we're playing with toys and it's beautiful. It's just it's this neat. I'm like, oh, wow, this is so cool. And then you can hear in the room next to us this, this fight erupt. And it starts with voices and then it starts with loud bangs and noises and, t- and furniture getting overturned. And, and then uh, the cops running in and somebody running out and them running in telling me, take the kids, hide with the kids. He just threatened to shoot up the entire family. He went out to his car. So I'm, I've been there a total a couple of hours and I'm hiding in a storage closet with four crying children, right? And I remember going, oh, <laughs> oh, this, this, is, this is the world that some of our children live in, right? This is, this is, this is where God called me. This is where I'm supposed to be. I, rem- I have so many memories like that. I remember holding a precious baby who would only um, stop crying if you held them tight against your chest, and, and, and she was about eight months old. She had both legs in cast. And I remember we couldn't find a home for her, so holding her for about 10 hours at work one day until we could find a place for her. Um, I, remember those, I remember beautiful things of seeing families reunited and coming together and seeing great things. It's a job of, of really high highs and really low lows. Um, but one of my, my biggest memories, this was happening so often, um, and it was just heartbreaking was I remember there was a period where we were having to sign up to take four hour shifts to sit with kids at a hotel room because we did not have foster homes in the valley. And some of these kids would be there and we would just have to take shifts at the that's since been made illegal in the state of Oregon. Um, so sometimes it gets even harder because now you have to find somewhere to put these children. Um, and I say all that to say this. Sometimes we don't think of ministry in broad enough terms. We have so many people, we think of ministers as someone who stands up here and preaches. We think of a ministry as someone who teaches, someone who has a theology degree. But we have so many people sitting here today that are in full-time ministry because of the way you love and take care of our community and our kids. And I thank you and God thanks you. Let me listen to some of these numbers. Last year in Oregon, 4,918 kids needed foster care. And there were only 3,200 certified homes. That's, that's, that's a sobering number, right? One in four adult Oregonians have now had some form of interaction with the foster care system, either personally through a family member or a friend. Last year, 162,185 calls were made to the CPS hotline. Of those, seven, almost 79,000 reported abuse. 42,876 of those were assigned for assessment, meaning they reached a level enough to believe that there was some sort of abuse taking place. And out of every assessment that was actually completed, meaning it was closed, and that, doesn't, that takes a long time for it to happen, 7,352 of those were founded for abuse involving 11,000 children. That's in our state, right? That is in this, this small state. Of those victims, about 1,900 of them were removed from their homes, which is 18% of the phone calls that came in. 41.5% of them were five years old or younger. And a total of 8,620 children spent at least one day in foster care last year in the state of Oregon. And so... The last few years of my job there, I had a couple of difficult cases I had that were really, really, really hard to the point where my heart was like, okay, I love that you're using me in this way, God, but I need to step out. I, I, I can't do this anymore. So I was blessed to switch over to the department called certification. And in certification is where you actually, um, there's a team that goes out and recruits, and then you have the blessing of teaching families how to be foster parents and then certifying their homes, making sure that they're safe, do a deep, deep dive, deep background check. Um, And again, I met more and more superheroes. 
During that time, I, during that time, five years of working there, I saw God's work being done daily in a more powerful way than I had ever seen, including 17 years of working for a church. And I say that confidently. I don't feel any blasphemy at all. It was unbelievable what God was doing amongst some people who don't even claim him as God. The kingdom of God, I, I, would, I would tell some, some of the fellow believers there, I'm like, they were like, how do you keep doing this? I was like, well, for me, it's a calling. I believe it's divine. They're like, well, what about all these people that aren't Christians? And I would just tell them, well, the kingdom of God conquers in spite of us, not because of us. Amen? I mean, that, that, I mean that's what the, how the kingdom of God works. We, we, we just have to get out of the way and, and be a part of this. And, and, and so I just want us to remember as we take into this month of, of just how can we be a part of this ministry? That's what it ultimately boils, boils down to. What can we as a church do? Um, because I believe that we could, this is, a, this is a void that we could step into as a church. We're always thinking of what can we do? How can we help the city of Ashland? How can we help the community? This is, this is work that God would love us to step into. And, and I, I believe that. Throughout scripture, God's heart for orphans and for vulnerable children is boldly and clearly proclaimed. Right? He declared himself to be the father to the fatherless, executing justice on behalf of the vulnerable over and over. And I believe that one way that we could do that is to support the foster care system in Jackson County. I believe foster care shows the love of Christ. I believe foster care supports and preserves families. I believe foster care is the mission field within our city that is most needed for Christians to step into. And I believe foster care helps more than anything heal the brokenness of this broken world. And so we want to take this month as a church to highlight stories where people are answering this call. Because, and we want you to know we're behind you and we're helping you and we want to help you. But our church is full of them. We have foster parents we have, that are here in our church that are actually legends in the Jackson County foster, foster home system. We have respite families. Um, so, so how can you help? Here's what I want, just to, the seed I want to plant as we move forward with different people sharing their stories. How can you help? Maybe it's considered being a foster parent. But I want you to know that is not for everyone. Do not feel like if I can't be a foster parent, I can't do this. That is not for everyone. You don't have to do that if that's not your calling. As a matter of fact, I'll try to talk you out of it if you come and talk to me. I'll tell you the hard truth just to make sure you know these sort of things, right? But there is a thing called a respite family. And maybe you've never heard of that. You can sign up. It's a lot easier process. And it's basically giving those families that are foster parents respite. You become certified child care so they can have a night out or even a weekend out. And you can just sign up and you can do, be a respite family. Maybe you can just volunteer. There's amazing organizations here in this valley. There's the Jackson County Foster Parent Association who always take donations of child baby stuff, car seats, those kind of things that are legal to donate that they can help families with. There's an incredible organization called Every Child. And I know there are several churches that already partner with them, especially around Christmas time. Churches help give gifts and donations for these kids in the foster care system that may not have the Santa Claus experience that we talked about this morning. And above all that, if we can do nothing else, we could commit as a church to pray. Amen? Couldn't we pray for the, these numbers? Wouldn't it be amazing if, if, if all of God's people came together and said, we're going to pray. We want to see this different. And these numbers just aren't here anymore right? Because we have enough people out there caring for our children and loving our children. So if you're already doing these things, we, from the bottom of our heart here as a church, we thank you. And we thank you're doing God's word and we're proud of it. And if you're not already doing that, would you just join us in thinking of ways that as a church, we can more step into this calling to help the least of these, to help the most vulnerable in our community. And for all of you that are a part of this, thank you. You're doing God's work. Hey, thank you. Last week, if you weren't here, um, we talked about uh, the place of God's presence, and we celebrated um, uh, six years of the story being here in this place, and even beyond that, we celebrated 125 years of this lot right here being a place that has hosted God's presence, and it's such a beautiful thing, and we do believe and we sense that this is a place where God is continuing to manifest his presence and reveal himself to people in a very particular way, and we're glad that 
you're here today and that's our prayer for you is that above all else, that you would encounter the presence of the living God here in this place. And that's our hope and prayer every Sunday is that every Sunday that when you come, you would step through these doors of this church and you would step into the presence of God and that his presence would fill every part of your being and you would know that he is near to you. Um, in light of that, uh, last week, just kind of this being the place of God's presence, our elder team's been praying about direction just for this season. And we're gonna be starting a brand new series today that is gonna lead us through the end of the year. And the series is called Presence. It is just about the presence of God. And so um, we're coming out of a series on prayer and we believe that God's presence is directly tied into prayer. And so we just felt like this is where God's wanting to lead us um, into having uh, deeper encounters with his presence and knowing how we can do that. And so really excited to um, introduce that series to you guys. And today that's what we're gonna be launching into. Um, as you probably know, experientially for each of you, there's times in your life where you may sense and feel God's presence to be very near. And then there's gonna be times in your life where, where you will not. Life isn't always, oh my gosh, God's present and near. There's kind of ups and downs. But what I found is that the key to encountering God's presence in every season is to learn to cultivate a hunger for the presence of God. A, a desire for that and actively seeking after that. Um, an amazing pastor named John Tyson, he said it this way. He said, God comes where he's wanted. God comes where he's wanted. And, and, and so the question is, do, do you want the presence of God? Do you want God's presence in your life? James, who's a lot older than John Tyson in James 4.8, one of the disciples, he, he put it this way. James 4.8, he said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is the way that it works I found most often. As we draw near to God, as we desire his presence and press into it, those are the times and the moments where we sense, wow, God, you really are here. It's something that doesn't just come natural. It's something that we actually have to pursue. And if you reorient your life around this reality, that if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you, that God comes most where he's wanted. If you start to live a life in a way that you're actually pursuing the presence of God, you will have encounters with God that many other people will never have. God will bypass the 99 lukewarm hearts to reveal himself to the one person who is pursuing his presence above all else. God will bypass the 99 lukewarm churches that are just going through the motions and he will reveal himself and he will pursue the church that doesn't care about being relevant, the church that doesn't care about the numbers, the church that doesn't care about going through the motions, the church that is just actively saying, God, more than anything, we want your presence. That's the church that is gonna have God's presence there. That's the people whose hearts and lives are gonna be changed. But here's the problem. What if you don't really want his presence? We were just singing those songs about God's presence, which were so beautiful. God, I'm caught up in your presence and I don't want anything more than just to sit here at your feet. But the reality is, as we're singing those songs, some of you are here and that's not actually the greatest desire of your heart. You don't actually want the presence of God. You don't actually crave the presence of God. If all of us in this room are completely honest and vulnerable, some of you here today would say, I don't, I don't long for it. I don't desire it. And some of you here would say, man, I want to want God's presence, but I just don't know why I don't. I want to want it, but I don't feel it. I don't desire it, but I want that desire. Where's, why the gap? Why don't I have that desire? And for some of you, you would say, man, I did want God's presence. There was a season where I did want it. I was hungry, I was thirsty, and I, I felt like he never showed up. And now that desire's gone. And maybe now you're frustrated and angry with God because you had this desire for more of his presence in your life. And for some reason, you felt like that desire went unmet. What do you do when you're struggling with your faith? What do you do when you're doubting? What do you do when you don't have a desire for the presence of God? In all of this, the big question that I think comes to mind that I wanna address this morning is simply this. How do we cultivate a heart that desires nothing more than the presence of God? Because the truth is some of us right now don't have that heart and that's okay. If that's where you're at this morning, God wants your vulnerability. He wants your realness. You don't have to put on the show and say, God, I do desire your presence more than anything. If you're not feeling that, 
God knows that already. And God wants to meet you where you're at in spite of your desires and feelings. But again, the big question is, how can we cultivate a desire for the presence of God? How can our desire for God's presence become something so genuine that everything else we desire in life pales in comparison? We don't want a a fake desire where we just have to put on the show and yeah, I really am wanting God. No, how does that desire become genuine? And that is the question that I want to address this morning, how to cultivate a desire and a spiritual hunger for the presence of God when you feel and sense that it is absent in your life. Psalm 63, if your Bible's open, we're gonna have it on the screen as well. Starting in verse one, the psalmist David writes this. He says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David here, the author of many of the Psalms, writes this psalm as he is wandering in the wilderness of Judah. In the context of this psalm, David had uh, just, his, his son Absalom had just rebelled against him and was seeking to overthrow David and to take his kingdom from him. And David had to flee from his kingdom into the wilderness for his life. He's wandering in the wilderness. He's without food. He's without water. He's without shelter. And he's without protection. And in this moment, he cries out and says, God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. David said this when he was in the empty, barren, dry wilderness with absolutely nothing. It's important to understand the context because we'd be tempted to believe that maybe I would desire God more Maybe I would press into God's presence more and pursue his presence more if I was just in a little bit better of a place. Maybe I would desire it more if my life was just a little easier. Maybe I would pursue his presence more if I just had a little bit more time. Maybe I would pursue and desire his presence more if I, was just in a, if I just had more security, if I was just in a better place financially, if my relationships that I currently have weren't so draining, if I just had a little less stress in my life, if I just had fill in the blank. We are tempted to believe that we would desire God more if things got better. But the reality is that's actually not true. David didn't say, God, I desire you and my soul thirsts for you. He didn't say that when he was sitting in the comfort of his palace. He didn't say that when he was feasting at the banquet table with all of his friends. He didn't pen these words when he was gazing out over his kingdom, realizing, wow, I have everything that I want. He penned these words when he was the most empty and when he felt abandoned and was wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. This is so important to understand because the emptiness that fills the space between what you desire and what you have, the emptiness that fills the space between what I want to be and where I want to be and where I currently am, that emptiness is actually a gift from God. Because the place where hunger is formed is not when we are full, but the place where hunger is formed is when we are the most empty. Our emptiness will reveal what our deepest desires are. And so a hunger for the presence of God, if you're here today and you're like, man, why don't I have that? I don't have it. I don't want it. I want to want it. I did want it. Why don't I have it? It's important to know that a hunger for God's presence doesn't come out of a place of fullness. It comes from a place of emptiness. And God will often place you in empty spaces like he did David, allowing him to be in the wilderness. God will often bring you to a place of emptiness to form in you a deeper hunger and desire for him. So some of us here today, you, you maybe need to change the way that you've been praying. Some of you here today, maybe you need to stop praying for God to give you more and instead say, God, give me less so that I would hunger and desire after you. Some of us maybe need to stop praying, God, fix my uncomfortable situations, but instead say, God, give us your comforting presence in the midst of our discomfort. 
Some of us may need to stop praying, God, take away the hardship and the pain and the suffering. Make it end, make it stop. But instead say, God, would you use my suffering to birth in me a desire and a dependence on your daily grace and to see that it is sufficient to see that your presence and your grace is sufficient even when I sense that I have nothing. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, verse six. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Jesus said, if you truly desire this, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied. But again, this is important to understand. In order to be hungry and thirsty, in order to desire righteousness, we have to first be empty. We have to let go of everything else. Hunger is birthed in the place of emptiness. And some of you, you guys know this on a practical level, right? You had a long day, you didn't eat. Do you ever crave a certain food when you're just super hungry? For me, straight up, it's T-Bell. That's my love language, not gonna lie. (laughs) T-Bell is my love language, but the thing is, I've never craved T-Bell after I just made myself like a nice chicken or steak dinner. I've, I've never made dinner, ate it, and then be like, oh my gosh, I really want T-Bell. I crave T-Bell the most, actually interesting, after I'm done preaching on a Sunday morning because I usually wake up really early. I don't eat a whole lot of breakfast. Service gets out. I'm super exhausted and it sets in. And even right now, I'm tempted to just drop the sermon because I'm telling you that Chipotle grilled ranch chicken burrito and those nacho fries, they're, they're calling my name right now, I'm telling you. Straight up, it's calling my name. And again, the hunger for that comes because of the emptiness. And again, it's, it's, it's so important to get us to cultivate a hunger for God's presence when you don't feel it. We actually have to empty ourselves first. Maybe the reason you're here today and you're honestly saying, God, God I haven't desired your presence. Maybe it's just because you're too full. Maybe it's because you're not empty enough. Maybe you're here and the reason you haven't been desiring the presence of God and you don't hunger for it and thirst for the presence of God is because you've just been too busy. You've been too distracted, doom scrolling on TikTok or binging the latest season of Jenny and Georgia, Ted Lasso or Succession. Honestly, that, that, that could be it. Your desires are for other things. You're filling your time and your desires with other things. And so there is no hunger and thirst for righteousness and for the things of God. Maybe the reason you're not saying like David, God, I thirst for you. My soul desires you is because you've been trying to fill the desires of your heart and those hungers and those longings for God apart from God. You've been trying to do it on your own. And so I wanna ask you this question this morning. Are you empty enough to long for the presence of God? Are you empty enough? It's not until like David, you are completely empty. You are in the barren wilderness. It is not until we are completely emptied of ourselves that we will see God's presence is enough. Is your season right now dry enough to to thirst for him? God put us in dry seasons so that we would thirst for your presence like David did? Are you lost enough to to earnestly seek him? My prayer for you above all else this morning is that you would say, God, what are those things in my life that I've just been filling myself up with? And maybe that's the reason I'm not hungering and thirsting after you. What do I need to empty? What do I need to offer to you this morning? What do I need to let go of so that I might hunger and thirst for you? And my prayer is that God would reveal that to you And that you in an act of obedience would say, God, I'm giving you this. I'm giving you these misplaced desires so that I might desire your presence. The good news is this. If you're here this morning and you feel empty, if you're here this morning and you feel lost, if you're here this morning and you feel you're in a dry season, God wants to restore to you a desire for himself in that season. Don't leave this morning without fully entrusting yourself to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. David continues in verse three and four, and and look what he says here. And honestly, this phrase here, this is hard for us to believe. He says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. This statement, verse three, this is honestly 
one of the most profound statements in all of the scripture. And if I'm completely honest, it's hard for me to believe. It's hard for me to believe this. It's hard for me to feel this. It's hard for me to sense that this could be real. David says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. What David meant by this, that God, your steadfast love is better than life, what he meant by this is that all of his desires and all of his longings, they were not only met, but filled to a place of overflow when he came into the presence of God and encountered God's perfect love for him. God, your love for me, which is found in your presence, it's better than life itself. All of my desires for anything else, they're met and they're filled to a place of overflow in your presence. That's hard to believe that that could actually be real for me. And I'm sure for you, that may be hard to believe. How can that actually be real? How can God's presence actually be that good? But David said, man, this is it. This is the key. This is the secret. All my desires are met and filled in the person of Jesus Christ, in Yahweh. And here's the thing. We have desires. We have longings. To be human is to have desire. God created us to have longings. God created us to hunger and thirst and to have desires. All those things are not bad, but the problem is we often turn to the wrong places to try to fill them. This is the problem. The problem isn't our longings. The problem isn't our desires. The problem isn't our hungers and thirsts. It's where we turn to try to fill them. The prophet Jeremiah said it this way in Jeremiah chapter two, verse 13. Listen to this. This is, this is so good. He says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Do you know what the difference is between a fountain and a cistern? A fountain brings forth water on its own, but a cistern is a product of man's own effort, digging and digging and digging to try to achieve the water below the surface. Now think about this for a minute. If you were in the wilderness and you were stranded and you ran out of water and you were completely dehydrated and all of a sudden you came across a natural spring of water, a fountain of water springing up from the ground, how stupid would it be to take your shovel and try to dig a well right next to it for the next two hours? Nobody would ever do that. That would be the stupidest thing in the world. But here's the sad reality. We all do exactly that all the time in our relationship with God. This is what we do. We say, God, I'm thirsty. God, I'm hungry. God, I'm empty. God, I have all these unfilled desires. And what do we do? We try to fill them by digging our own wells. We just start digging. Oh, I can do it. I can get to the end of my emptiness. I can fill the desires myself. I can quench the thirst that I'm feeling on myself. And we just dig and dig and dig. And it is completely empty. You say, some of you this morning, God, I'm empty of love. And what do we do? We start digging our own wells on Tinder and Hinge and bubble, Bumble. We start sleeping around because hookup culture is so normalized and convenient and easy in our culture because we've believed the lie that the more I give my body to others and the more that I use their bodies for my own satisfaction, the more I'm gonna feel loved and the more I'm gonna feel satisfied. But you can just keep digging at that well all you want and guess what? You're gonna to continue to feel more and more empty because you're not drinking from the fountain of living water whose love is better than life. You might be here this morning and say, God, I'm empty of purpose. And what do we do? We start digging a well to make a name for ourselves, clawing our way to the top of the cultural success ladder so that people will finally see me so that people will finally value me, so that people will finally recognize me, so that people will finally see how great I am and respect us because we've believed the lie that our purpose is dependent on how we are perceived by others. And you can keep digging that well all you want to try to find purpose and it's gonna leave you empty. Or you can turn to the fountain of living water and find your full purpose in the person of Jesus and you can come and drink freely of that. You say, God, I'm empty of identity. I don't know who I am. And what do we do in our culture? We start digging our own wells of self-identification and of self-exploration apart from God because we've believed the lie that I get to define myself. 
and that nobody else can tell me who I am and how I feel about myself is more true than how God feels about me. And guess what? You can keep digging that well. You can keep trying to find yourself by looking to yourself and you're gonna continue to feel that void of emptiness grow more and more and more. But if you turn to the fount that is Christ, you will find your identity is secure in him. You will find who God created you to be in the person of Jesus. Here's the reality. No amount of digging, no amount of human effort, no amount of sex or money or fame or influence or success or power can fill the longings and the desires that are in your heart that God has given you. Nothing can fill them. The world was not designed to, to, to fulfill the desires of the heart that God has given you. God has given us a heart that can only find its desires filled in the person of Jesus, the fountain of living water, whom David found and said, your love, your steadfast love, it is better than life itself. And David knew this better than any of us. David, here's the reality. He had more sex than you're ever gonna have. I'm just saying it. More sex than you will ever have. David as a king had countless gorgeous wives in his beautiful palace. David had all the sex that he wanted. And guess what? When David says your steadfast love is better than life, because of what he'd experienced being king, he's saying your love, God, it's actually better than sex. It's better than all the sex or sexual fulfillment I can find. Your love is actually better than that. I know that's hard for us to believe, but David had experienced that, God, your love is better than life. Your love is better than sex. David had more power than you will ever have. David, as a king, had countless servants who would do anything for him at his bidding. Hey, back massage, please. I'm a little sore after that morning run. Morning macchiato, please. I'm kind of thirsty. Falafel platter, extra hummus, please. I'm getting kind of hungry. Wouldn't that be nice? Have people just give you everything you want whenever you want? David had that. David had all the power in the world ruling over his kingdom. And yet he said, God, your steadfast love is better than life, which for David would have also meant, God, your love is better than power. I have all the power in the world and God, your love is greater than this. Serving you is better than having thousands of servants serving me. Your presence and your love is better than life. It's better than power. David had more recognition and fame than you will ever have. They said Saul has slayed his thousands, but David has slayed his tens of thousands. David was the original verified blue check mark in the Jerusalem Twitter of the time. Like he was a celeb to the max. I'm just saying it as it is. David has slayed his tens of thousands. People are praising him. He was the OG original influencer. And David says, God, your love is better than life. Meaning your love is better than the fame, than the influence, than the recognition that I have. All these people praising me who think I'm so great. All my followers who think I'm so great. God, your love, which is found in your presence, is better than that. It's better than success. It's better than fame. It's better than recognition. It's better than all the praises of men. He says, your love is better than life. David had more money than you will ever have. Second, or first Chronicles 22, verse 14, it says this, this is crazy. He, David says, with great pains, I have provided for the house of the Lord, a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, of bronze and iron beyond weighing, for there is so much of it, timber and stone too, I have provided. To these you must add, he was saying that to his son Solomon. Solomon, you gotta do more. Like this, this is crazy. I did the math here through looking up in some commentaries. In today's world, 100,000 talents of gold, just David's gold alone, would be worth modern day $89 billion. If you added up all David's net worth from his kingdom, scholars estimate that his total assets and his net worth would have been in modern day money, $125 trillion. That makes Elon Musk's bank account look like a five-year-old's piggy bank with a few coins. Like, we can't even fathom that number, $125 trillion. I say that to say this, David had all the money in the world, greater than all of our net worths put together. And he said, God, your steadfast love is better than life. Meaning what? It's even better than money. It's better than wealth. 
All these things David had, sex, power, influence, fame, prestige, success, money, all the things that in our culture, those are the things we're chasing after. And you can keep chasing and chasing and chasing. But David said, hey, I found this secret here. God, your presence, God, your love, it's better than life. It's better than all these things. David found something better and more satisfying than anything and everything he ever tried, which is better than anything and everything we can ever try. It was the steadfast loving kindness of God, which is found when we come into his presence empty and say, God, I desire nothing more than you. I hunger and thirst for you. And it is not until you come and drink freely from the fountain of living waters which is found in God's presence, that you can actually discover this to be true for yourself as well. That God, your presence and your love is better than life itself. The the, the, the psalmist said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Some of you, you don't know that this is possible because you simply haven't come and drank from this fountain yet. You've been digging your own wells You've been trying to get your own water, trying to quench all your own thirst. And today, God would invite you, the spirit would invite you to come and drink of the eternal fountain that is Christ Jesus. And you will discover an unquenchable love that the father has for you. You will discover the purposes and plans that God has for you, which no eye has seen, which no ear has heard, the things that God has planned for those who love him. You will find those in the person of Jesus. So here's my question I wanna close with. Are you tired of digging? Are you tired of digging? Are you tired of year after year after year, month after month, week after week, day after day, all the desires of your heart going unmet. Are you tired of that? Are you tired of not feeling loved? Are you tired of living without purpose? Are you tired of not knowing who you are? Are you tired of digging your own wells, trying to get satisfaction, trying to find fulfillment, trying to quench the desires of your heart? Are you tired of that? If so, I have good news for you today. There is a fountain that will never run dry, a fountain that you can freely come and drink of today that will quench the thirst of your heart and every desire of your heart. And that fountain is found in the presence of God. When we come empty and say, God, I'm not bringing my agenda. I'm not bringing my success. I'm not bringing my money. I'm not bringing anything. I'm coming into your presence completely empty and asking that you would fill me. This is the invitation I believe Jesus is extending to our church family today to come and to drink of his presence, to come and drink of the fount that never runs dry. And when you come empty into his presence, if you haven't had this desire a true desire for God, when you come empty, God will meet you with that desire. God will give you that desire. So today, would we, as a church family, would you, wherever you're at today, I just wanna invite you, as Jesus invites us to come and drink, to come and put our shovel down and to come and drink of the love which is found in his presence, which is better than life itself. Amen?